this is the key focus of our worship this morning. As we understand where the offerings go and as Deuteronomy reminds us that those tithes are brought in so that the Levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own and the foreigners, the fatherless, the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Dear people of God, this is Reformation Sunday, and it's also our Meet the Budget Sunday. And those two focuses, I'd like to suggest to you, go together hand in hand in a marvelous way. Very fitting to celebrate both of them together. Reformation Sunday, 499 years ago, and that means next year will be 500, 500 years ago, the anniversary of the Reformation. Martin Luther had 95 statements that he published, and according to historical accounts, he also nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. And in those 95 statements, Martin Luther wanted to generate a vigorous discussion about the heart of salvation. He was calling the church to go back to something that was absolutely foundational in terms of understanding the biblical teaching of salvation. You don't buy salvation, was his basic premise. It's not for paying indulgences that God gives you salvation. And you don't pay for it by your works. You don't earn that salvation, but it is a gift of God's grace and the work and the response, the financial contributions, all of that flows out of a heart of gratitude that is overwhelmingly thankful to God. And so 95 discussions, statements, theses were published by Martin Luther to generate a discussion about going back to the essential truth of Scripture with regarding to salvation and the Word of God. This morning, we are going to do a little journey of our own back to Scripture, back to the understanding of offerings, and God's essential intention for offerings and tithes. Offering the tithes, according to the passage that we have read here, is taking the first tenth, not what's left over, not, first of all, meeting all of the other requirements or interests or uh, desires of our heart and then giving God what's left over. No, God's understanding as he has published that clearly in his word is that the first tenth gets dedicated to him, gets set aside. And to really appreciate that, to live into it, to embrace that and to love that idea We need to go back and understand the essential purpose and designation of those offerings then and our offerings today. Where did the offerings go in Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29? The priesthood and the temple ministry, festival celebrations, and charity. If we put all of those together, as we're going to do it this morning, we get a wonderful picture, a marvelous celebration picture of life lived with God. First of all, the priesthood and the temple ministry. Do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. Basically, this is what is being referred to. When the people of Israel went out of Egypt, and they entered into the land of the promise, and the land was divided under the rule of Joshua and the guidance of Joshua. They marked the boundaries, and Judah got this part, and Ephraim got that part, and Manasseh got land here, etc., etc. You know how that went, right? 
divide it all up and mark out the boundaries of the land. And then within those boundaries of the tribes, give it to the family allotments. And each family gets their parcel of land, but not the Levites. The Levites were to be the priestly minister servants within the land of Israel. And so they didn't farm the land. They took care of the temple services. They took care of the priestly duties. And in God's system, he says, when you take your tenth and you offer that tenth to the Lord, part of that goes to support the priesthood. And the Levites would receive their financial support, their livelihood out of those offerings. And they, in turn, were to take one-tenth of what they received and also give that back to the Lord. God is saying, I'm going to bless you. I've given you this land. It was mine, and I give it to you. You can farm it. You can grow crops. If you're faithful to me, I will bless you, and you will have an abundance. You won't be lacking. I will protect you. But this is what I ask of you. Celebrate that relationship with me joyfully as you bring the first tenth, as you offer your tithe. And part of that went to support the Levites. And broadly understood, that meant also uh, maintaining the sanctuary where the Levites would serve and and providing for all of those services. It, It was, in a sense, that component of our church budget that supported the ministry. Secondly, in Numbers and in Deuteronomy, God describes festival celebrations. In fact, God makes it very clear that there are three times a year that there were special occasions where they would be bringing their offerings and serving the Lord with them. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God. Three times a year there were festivals, pilgrimage festivals, And they would go to the central sanctuary and it would be a time of rejoicing. This was not to be drudgery. This was not, oh no, uh, here we go again. We got to go and pay our taxes. So I guess we better go and do our duty and, and bring that. No, these were joyful celebrations. These were the highlights of the year. Passover. They would be reminded of that incredible time in Egypt. When the tenth plague came and the firstborn of the Egyptians lost their lives as God liberated his people. But the door frames that had the blood of the covenant on it, those houses were spared. And so this would be a reminder that, that annually, they had the remembrance that God had delivered them out of bondage, out of Egypt, taken them out of death, given them life, life in abundance. It was a fantastic remembrance. And the whole family was included in it. The children could ask their questions and there was preparation and there was food and there was drink, and that all came out of their offerings that they brought before the Lord. The second festival was the festival of weeks or Pentecost. It corresponded with the harvest of the new wheat. And as they brought in the wheat, as they brought in the grain, they were also reminded of Sinai, the covenant the giving of the law that set them free to be the people of of God, that law that said to them, 
you are my people in such a special way that I want you to love me and I will love you and I'm going to regulate your lives with a, with a law of love so that you can thrive and flourish and prosper in the land. And the third was the festival of booths, also at times called the festival of huts or the festival of tabernacles. And for a week on this pilgrimage festival, they would live in little huts that they had built. They would go to the central sanctuary and they would live in these huts and they were decorated with branches. And in the simplicity of those little huts, they would remember that they had lived for 40 years in the wilderness and God had brought them through the wilderness into a land that was flourishing, a land that was, that was rich in its harvests. The festival of huts corresponded with their autumn harvests. The grain was in. The grapes were harvested. God had blessed them in abundance and they had what was the equivalent of, a, of an incredible week-long thanksgiving celebration. And from the offerings that they would bring, they could eat, they could have a barbecue, they could roast the grains, they could drink the new wine. And it was a tremendous, tremendous celebration in the presence of God. I hope you catch the excitement of, of those offerings. It was loading the table. It was coming into the presence of God saying, hasn't God been marvelous in the way that he has set us free? These, these were salvation events and harvest events and it was all rolled together into the joyous celebration of what it meant to be the people of God, blessed by God and loved by him. And then third, some of the offerings went to charity. And the foreigners, the fatherless, the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied. God doesn't want people living so marginally that they're basically dying of starvation, that they don't have any food to eat, any place to sleep, any support, any care. God didn't, didn't want a model in that society where the rich would simply get richer and the poor would be totally forgotten and, and they could fend for themselves and if they couldn't fend for themselves, die in the street. In fact, God's grace goes so far as to say it's not only the poor among you, it's not only the widows, it's not only the unemployed, those who are handicapped and not able to work or, or whatever, even the foreigners, even those who were by definition of the covenant outside of the people of God were to be embraced with charity so that if they were there in the land of Israel, if they were in our country, they wouldn't starve. If they were in our community, if they were in our town, they were protected and they were loved and they were embraced and they were cared for because God is a God of grace, grace and his people are intended to be a people of grace. So what we have in the offerings is a blueprint, a marvelous blueprint, a, a marvelous financial, spiritual, religious plan by means of which that first 10%, that tithe, would fund the priesthood and the temple and the Levites would accommodate the festivals and the celebration and the rejoicing and support the works of charity. Now, our contemporary situation in offerings, we can make a comparison for a moment and we need to do that. 
we've been reminded this morning of where our offerings go. And you know, in a sense, we can just simply make a comparison and we can say, uh, given the differences between today and 3,000 years ago, you can draw lines of correspondence. Our budget supports the ministry. It supports the, the building. It supports those who have dedicated their lives to ministry and to the so-called professional priesthood of the church. It also supports charity and the spreading of God's love and God's grace through the immediate community, but also worldwide in the various endeavors of the denomination. And in a sense, those aspects that are summarized in Deuteronomy 14 have an equivalent, an equation with our offerings as well. Our offerings go to Christian ministry in some ways, given the differences of culture and society and times and whatnot, to similar causes of ministry. But we need to ask a question. Do we need another reformation? And the reason that I ask this question this morning is because I think that we have lost something of the joy of the offerings. We have lost something of the tremendous enthusiasm. Perhaps I'm wrong. I would love to be wrong on this, but I think that most of us kind of cringe at the idea of a meet the budget Sunday. We don't look forward to it. I don't look forward really to preaching that sermon because I know that there will be people that don't like it when the focus is on giving and on preaching. And I suspect that there are perhaps even a few people that stay away from church on meet the Sunday, meet the budget Sunday. And that it just isn't our favorite Sunday of the year. But maybe it should be. And maybe we need a reformation in, in a sense in which we reclaim and recapture the biblical principle of the joy of giving. Rejoice. Moses said in Deuteronomy 14, rejoice in your festivals, rejoice in bringing your offerings, rejoice in supporting the ministry of God. Think about this, this for a moment. Imagine if, if Meet the Budget Sunday could kind of be presented like Easter and Thanksgiving and Christmas, all wrapped up together in, in one marvelous focus. And that there could be food, and that there could be celebration, that there could be a potluck dinner, and that there could be astonishing delight to bring the first fruits of what God has given to us back to Him. Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and meet the budget Sunday? Yes, really. Isn't that what meet the budget is all about? Isn't that who we are as the people of God? We are the people of Easter because we rejoice in the realization that Jesus Christ is our risen Lord and Savior and he has paid for all of our sins and we have the new Passover because the blood of Jesus Christ has set us free and it is a festival. Thanksgiving? When has the people of God ever been more richly blessed than what we are today? The houses that we live in are incredible. The vehicles that we drive, the things, the opportunities, what we have, what we can do, the places where we can go, the food that we can eat, the clothing that we wear. God has blessed us in an 
incomparable way. Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's all because of his son. It's all because Jesus Christ left the splendor and the glory of heaven, the incomparable wealth of heaven, and came down to earth and humbled himself and went into a stable that we can enjoy this, this life with God. And Meet the Budget Sunday is just really our way of saying thank you to God because he has done all of this for us when we didn't deserve it and he has made all of this worship possible and he has called us, he has adopted us as his children and he has said to us, you are precious to me and I want you to come into my presence and I want you to rejoice and I want you to bring your, your first fruit and no, you don't have to bring it all, just, just a tenth and enjoy the rest of it as you choose and to honor me with it, but, but bring that tenth to support the ministry and to rejoice in worship and to support the foreigners, and to make sure that this kingdom continues to go and to grow. That's what God's saying. So maybe we need a reformation. Maybe, maybe we need to start celebrating Meet the Sunday Budget, like a festival, like an opportunity to be happier than we are at any other time of the year. Maybe we need to celebrate Meet the Budget a Sunday from now on with the, the biggest potluck that we could ever imagine and, and just make it a celebration. You know, I, I've seen cultures where when the offering is announced, people actually begin to clap and to dance and to sing as they bring the offerings to the front. They're just so happy that God has given them so much. Do you know, we, we miss something. We miss something that should be at the very heart of who we are if we're not dancing to bring the offerings. If not on the outside, at least inside in the heart. That, that heart is doing a skip and a jump and a dance. To know that God has, has blessed us so marvelously and now he welcomes us as his children to love him in return with our offerings. And knowing where they go and knowing how important they are for building God's church and kingdom. Maybe we need a reformation. A reformation of our thoughts and minds and hearts with regard to meet the budget Sunday, but maybe we need a bigger reformation than that. Maybe we need a reformation of how we actually celebrate Meet the Budget Sunday. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, it doesn't seem like a big journey from our homes to church. It doesn't feel like a pilgrimage. Sometimes it doesn't feel like a vacation. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's all that super special. But Father, we pray that you will help us to reclaim the joy of bringing our offerings. Reclaim that deep, deep satisfaction in knowing that you have abundantly provided for us and we wouldn't think of hoarding it for ourselves. Father, we pray that you will rekindle within us the joy of giving, knowing that we'll never outgive you. Father, we pray that when we think of our offerings, that we may reflect on them with festive joy, knowing that you are worthy of our offerings and you have given us so, so much, and what a privilege. What a deep, deep privilege it is to join you. To join you in the ministry of your church and kingdom. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.